This is video number six of chapter two in The Manipulated Mind by Denise Wynn. Shine, Hinkle, Wolf, Merlou, and Lipton all agree that personality was an important factor in whether an individual capitulated to or resisted communist influence. All have said, in one form or another, that those with well-integrated, stable personalities were the ones least susceptible to psychological pressure. However, Dr. William Sargent, a British psychiatrist, believes that what happened in Korea was just one form of the sudden conversion syndrome, a phenomenon which can be explained in physiology alone. Personality, insofar as it plays a part in Sargent's thinking, dictates not ability to resist, but length of time it takes to collapse. People of stable personality may take longer to fall, he says, but far from being immune, they are the most likely to remain faithful longest to their newly implanted convictions. He believes that had it not been for language difficulty and a certain unsubtlety of technique, the Chinese could certainly have won over more soldiers. Sargent offers a package to explain what he sees as the inevitability of conversion once the right stresses are imposed on the brain. He explains dramatic religious conversion, brainwashing or dramatic political conversion, false confessions, and psychoanalytically induced insights by physiological events to which only certain mentally ill people are immune. He relies for his assertions on the work of Pavlov. Unlike Merleau, he doesn't claim that the Chinese achieved what they achieved because they studied Pavlov, but he does believe that Pavlov's findings regarding reactions to stress are the key to understanding any sudden conversion, political or religious. He says in Battle for the Mind, where he explains his theory, the political-religious struggle for the mind of man may well be won by whoever becomes most conversant with the normal and abnormal functions of the brain and is readiest to make use of the knowledge gained. Sargent's interest in the work of Pavlov stemmed from his experiences during the Second World War, treating shell-shocked soldiers. His reading of Pavlov threw light for him on why the soldiers recovered from mental breakdown if they could be induced to experience emotional discharge of an intense nature, and led him to posit that the success of religious and political conversions was based on the manipulation of the same physiological processes. In the course of his work on conditioned learning in dogs, Pavlov started to make discoveries about the dog's reactions to stress, he found that his dogs could be divided into four temperament types. The first two he called strong, excitatory, and lively, the second group being less extreme in their excitability, but both groups likely to respond to stress by showing heightened excitement and aggression. The other two types were more passive in their reaction. One Pavlov termed the calm and perturbable type, the other the weak inhib inhibitory type. This last group tended to react to stress with extreme passivity in order to avoid tension. Strong experimental stresses reduced the, such dogs to a state of paralysis and an inhibition or blocking of brain function. However, Pavlov, Pavlov found the other three types of dogs, if exposed to more stress than they too could stand, the amounts being higher than for the weak inhibitory type, also reached a, a state of brain inhibition. He decided that this inhibition must therefore be a protective mechanism designed to protect the brain when the system was pressed beyond all endurance. Which category a dog fell into was decided, he believed, by environmental stresses to which it had been exposed right from birth and to which it had been conditioned to react in particular ways in accordance with its own temperament. Lively and calm, imperturbable dogs could withstand much more stress than either strong or weak excitatory types. The inhibition which occurred when all dogs had passed their limit of endurance, Pavlov called it 
transmarginal inhibition. It had definite stages of buildup signaled by particular abnormal behavior patterns. Pavlov found that he could induce brain inhibition by imposing four different types of stress and monitor the development of the abnormal behavior. To induce the intolerable stress, he would increase the voltage of electric shock applied to the dog's leg as part of its conditioning process. If the shock was too strong for its system to tolerate, the dog started to break down. Another method was to signal the arrival of the dog's food and then make them wait a long time for it to appear. The dogs reacted very quickly to waiting under stress. Thirdly, he might confuse the dogs by giving them conflicting signals so that the dogs became uncertain what to expect. Finally, he might induce stress by physical means, such as overworking them or depriving them of food. Wow, what a monster. Pavlov found that if he first wore down the dogs in one or more of these ways, new conditioned behavior patterns, such as responding to a given signal in a given way, were much easier to implant. However, whereas the weak inhibitory type dogs broke down much faster, they were likely to forget those new behavior patterns once they recovered. The dogs that were harder to break down were more likely to hold on to the behavior patterns for a long time after. Pavlov presumed that due to temperament they held on to the new patterns as tenacious, tenaciously as they had once held on to their old ones. During this whole process, Pavlov isolated three distinct stages that led on to collapse as extreme stresses mounted. First came what he termed the equivalent phase of brain activity, when a dog would react in the same way to all stimuli of whatever strength. Pavlov measured this, this by saliva production. One might equate this with the familiar phenomenon of a person reacting no more strongly to an important experience than to a trivial one. The exhausted woman who receives a cup of tea and the news that she has won the football pools with equal mild pressure. When exposed to even stronger sustained pressures, the dog would move into what Pavlov called the paradoxical phase. Here the brain would, eat, would cease to react to strong stimuli at all as a protective measure while still capable of responding to mild ones. This therefore gave rise to a circumstance which, in humans, could be manifested as an inability to cry on hearing of the death of a loved one, but to be intensely irritated and upset by the loss of an earring. And that was part six of chapter two. And we will pick up again with part seven. And we are reading from The Manipulated Mind by Denise Wynn. And I will see you all in the next video.